Hello and welcome to the Common Sense Gospel. I am Danny Simmons, and today I have with us Ben Schneider. Ben is a member at Northwest Church of Christ, and we are going to do our very best to cover our title today, which is Understandable Objections. And Ben is perfect for this. Ben, I appreciate your willingness to be here and spending time with us. Thank you, Danny. It's my pleasure. Hopefully I can provide something helpful. Oh, I know that you can. I'm I'm, I'm excited (laughs) about this, honestly. As we step into this special episode and what could possibly be a series because of the the length at which you've expressed some of the understandable ob- objections that, that you had in your life, that we want to work through those because these, these are very real and they happen for people all the time. I believe that members of the church who have been members for 10, 15, 20 years, they're going to come across an understandable objection in their own faith and say, oh, I need to rethink that. You know, I thought I knew this. I, I really honestly think that happens. It certainly happened to me. So it's a valuable topic, and, and you're just the perfect one to talk to about that, And as, as far as I can tell. Um, and for those of you who are listening to us, if you remember our crucifixion series, there were two men at the beginning of each show, except for the first one. You guys missed the first one. But the two guys, there were the two Jewish men who were trying to figure out who Jesus is, and ultimately became the two men walking to Emmaus when Jesus stepped in and said, what are you two talking about? The two men who are trying to figure out if they should follow Jesus or not. Uh, ben Schneider was one of them, and, and his son, Caden, was the other. And so we, we loved doing that with you. And and Caden, obviously, that, that was fun for us. But some of you may remember, remember Ben and the role he played there. He is also one of our singers for the trivia section of every podcast When we do trivia, sweet trivia, (laughs) Ben sings the tenor part in that, and his wife Megan also sang with us in that recording. And so that was another special moment that you spent with us, but also was a building block for for Kurt and I to not just say, now it's time for trivia, but to like really transition smoothly into that. And we found some people who respond back to us, they, they enjoy that little clip. So well done, sir. Thanks. I appreciate it. He yes. doesn't love a little trivia, except whenever you're the one trying to answer and you don't know. But otherwise, it's <laughs> I love asking it's fun. questions <laughs> more than answering them. But We yeah. already know the answer. It's fun to ask. It, so it's- yes, so true. And I know book, chapter, and verse because I got it written down. But your, your family is, is musically gifted. Uh, your oldest son is in the band, UT, University of Texas. That's a big deal, man. <laughs> and he's doing great there. Uh, you and your wife both played for the UT band in and, and, and different instruments. And so... the. Needless to say, the entire family is is gifted uh, musically, and, and we're we're blessed to have them with us at Northwest. So, as we look at the challenges that that we're going to deal with with you, there's there's an interesting difference between what we read about typically in the New Testament, especially in the Book of Acts. You look at Acts two thirty seven. Peter is preaching the gospel to these men, and they it says in Acts two thirty seven. They were pricked in their hearts, and they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? 3,000 people apparently jump in the water and are baptized for the remission of sins. And so we say, well, then that's how it has to be done. We preach, and people are baptized. But that is just not the case. The Ethiopian eunuch, Isaiah 53 is read to him, and he says, there's water. What's keeping me from being baptized? You know. So we watch that, and we go, well, there it is again. People should respond immediately. Lydia is another great example. In Acts chapter 16, it says there, the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And so, you know, again, God, God's involved in that one and, and tells us that he is. And with you, and I think with many others, it's a different story, which is why I've asked you to share your conversion story with all of us. And, and the, the other reason for that is because, to me, it's a powerful story. I believe it relates to all Christians and the process that each one of us have gone through during our own conver- conversions. And so for me to ask you personally, I need to back up to 2012, which is when I first got to Austin, and what I saw. Okay, so you you and your family are there attending at Northwest. Your wife obviously have been a member of the church for many years. Her father and her mother also attending at Northwest and still mm-hmm. are. You were at every service that you could possibly be at. And not only were you there while she was there, you attended when she wasn't in town or couldn't be at services, you were still coming. And so somebody told me, or I, it just became known that you were not a member of the church. And I thought, well, that, that <laughs> something ain't right. That can't be right. But it, in knowing that and in, in understanding that that was actually the case, it was amazing to me. And so from that point on, I had a deep, genuine interest in you and your story and your commitment to your family 
and understanding that, that the spiritual side of things was very important, but not yet having fully committed yourself to that. So um, I've said a lot. I want to just ask you about maybe that time window. You know, how, how, how was that working out for you? <laughs> That's a, a good question. I, I think back in, in you know, going back a little further, so my wife and I got married in 2000. We started dating in high school, our senior year of high school. I knew her faith at that point, and I had not grown up, you know, as we say, quote unquote, in the church. Exposure to different things from here and there, but, and I actually had uh, one of my best friends and ended up being one of my college roommates who his entire family was very faithful and uh, mem members of the church. And so I got some exposure through that. I got some exposure when I started dating Megan and I knew those things, but I had not, I had not had a lot of you know, education or attention paid to the Bible and to the faith and some other things through some of my grandparents and, and things like that here and there, but it wasn't consistent and it wasn't, it wasn't deep. Whenever Megan and I started dating, one of the things that we had, we had talked about, I don't know, relatively early on, I can't, I couldn't establish exactly when, when it was, but we talked about what we believed and she made it very clear because her faith was, even at that young age was, was absolute and it was very important to her. And in some ways, I think maybe subconsciously, I knew that that's part of, you know, why I was attracted to her and, and why we built such a strong relationship so quickly, even though I felt very differently. But we had talked about it and she knew where I stood and, and she didn't, I mean, it, she wanted that to be different. But at the same time, I, I had said from very early on, I just always said, I would never want to get in the way of your faith. And I would mm. always be supportive of you. I would make sure that I wouldn't do something that would would pull you away from that if that's truly how you believe. And there was, there's a little bit of personal background there that, that played into that a little bit. My, one of my grandmothers was faithful, attended a, a non-denominational church there in town. I, I'm too young to remember how scriptural things were in hindsight, but she did have that heart. And uh, my grandfather did not attend, never went with her. My mother would go sometimes until my grandmother became too ill to go regularly. But one of the things that I know was a challenge was that because my grandfather didn't go, she didn't end up going as often as she wanted to or intended to, especially as her health started fading. And I just remember that sticking with me and saying, you know, I wouldn't ever want that to be the case. Even if I'm not personally in agreement, I wouldn't want that to hinder her ability to, wow. to serve. Mm. I know that's probably kind of unusual, a little bit weird, but it just, I don't know. It was like, look, I care about you and you care about that. And uh, even if I'm not on board, I'm going to make sure that I don't get in your way. Yeah. And so that was sort of a starting point. So if you fast forward and we continue to date and things like that, and I, I would visit Northwest some through college and come on occasion, come to a singing or, or um, a Sunday morning service or things here and there. And then a little more frequently, and then when we got married, same sort of thing. I would come often because I wanted to be supportive. You know, I didn't want to be like, well, she's getting up early to go on Sunday morning and I'm just going to go back to bed. That what it just didn't feel right <laughs> no. at the very least. Right. Yeah. Independent of, of, of the material and it, and it being God's command, it just didn't, it didn't set well. So I was like, well, I'm going to go and be supportive. And there's another part of me that also, that's always been thinking about how am I looking at, am I taking in everything? Am I really listening and paying attention? Am I fixed in my ways? Am I not considering new information? Right. Like I, I've always wanted to be objective. I've always wanted to really analyze things and make sure I'm not being dismissive of something I shouldn't. And so while I didn't necessarily feel compelled to go on my own, I was like, well, I could at least go see and listen and understand more. And at the very least, I'll be able to reinforce why I don't agree or think what I think from, from doing that. Mm -hmm. And if I, and if I find new information that makes me feel differently, well, I need to, I need to listen to that. I need to pay attention. Oh, wow. So that was kind of the starting point. Right. And, and so then, yeah, fast forward, that's basically going on, you know, from 2000 up till the time we met, right. That's, that's essentially my mode. I'm continually going and learning. And I had some other Bible studies here and there. The individuals at Northwest were really great about being interested and caring, but also not high pressure. In I, the sense, I was going to ask you. I mean, I just feel this question has got to be asked. 
how much flack did you catch from our members? I think you pretty much just answered that. <laughs> yeah. There was a loving attentiveness to that. Yes. But not an over amount of pressure because I feel like you could have easily been run off where you're in the car driving home with your wife and just saying, look, you know, brother, so-and-so, I know, but they are giving me the business and the stink eye and everything else, which could be something where you say, I hope you understand, but I don't feel welcome there. Right. And that never happened. And that would, no, that never happened. Wow. And I think that's a really, really important point for my experience that had that, had that developed differently. I mean, I do think there's a good chance had, had I felt uncomfortable or pressured every single time I went that I probably would have been like, I, I'm out. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't that. And it was to my surprise. Cause I felt like I was going to get the pitch every single time. And I mean, yes, I hear the invitation and that's weighing and things. And, but you know, that's broadly, right? Like mm-hmm. that's, it's nobody's coming up to me and saying, Oh, you didn't come down this week. What's up? You know, like it wasn't, <laughs> we thought this was the week. <laughs> I'm sure some were thinking it, but like yeah. nobody, nobody's doing that. And, and, and that was actually really helpful to me. And, and I know it weighed on people's hearts. You know, what if something happens to me or whatever? And understandably so. Uh, but it helped me in a lot of ways to, to say, okay, they're not, nobody there is, it's not a high pressure sales situation. It's not mm-hmm. like, they care and they're genuinely interested. And it helped me like feel really authentic with the group, right? That they, this is genuinely what they care about. And they know that if they just sort of corner me into it, then it's not going to be genuine or real anyway. And God will know better. That's right. right? And so I, anyway, I think not to get off on a whole nother tangent, but that's a really important point that I think is helpful for those who are trying to bring people to the word to keep in mind, right? Is yes, you need to not let it go. You can't be hands off either because you, you have to keep applying that gentle pressure but it's gentle pressure, right? Mm-hmm. I, and you've got to you've got to figure out where people are and work through them and, and what it is that they're objecting to, right? Like and what's what's struggling with them. And sometimes it's hard to pinpoint. Absolutely, I, and that's that's wonderful to hear because that I, just as you said, that could be a huge turnoff. And it was, and again, as I am getting to know you and in, in the, the very early stages of that, that was one of my concerns: is how much pressure is he getting? Should I? Should I be a part of that, or do I need to just stand back and stay away from it? And, and in that process of time, there was a Bible study at Bobby and Sue Bradford's house that you were invited to. Um, do you remember all the people there, just off the top of your head? I, I do. Bobby, Sue, you, Ed Snap. Um, those those are the people who were always there, right? And and steady. And then there would sometimes be some other individuals who were who were there on different occasions. Neil and Brandy Munn. And, yep. That's right. And then Sharon Bartle came in at some point and she was sitting with us and studying. That's right. And so every person in a Bible study creates a particular dynamic. But what I remember specifically about you being there was that I, for, for the first time I got I got to hear you think through some of it. The, the way that study was designed was what are, what are you thinking about? What what are you working through currently that we can just kind of flesh out and talk about and look at what the Bible teaches, which is a very interesting approach. But for the first time, you, you would say things like, "I see what it says." I'm, I, 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 you know, at some places you would say, I, "I do think God has told us this," you know. So that would be a huge step. But then you would say, "Now, my understanding, the application of it to myself, to what extent, you know, you you were so thoughtful, it was almost like crippling for somebody like me." Was I used to just, I was used to just saying. Here's the verse. They got baptized, so let's go to the water. And you know, people are like, "Oh, okay, not you. You, you were like, I, yeah, I know that." But and so you're, you're like five or six layers deeper than what I had ever considered, which presented its own challenge. Again, just for me, I was not leading that Bible study. I was sitting in on it and just commenting when I could. But it was a wonderful setup. If you remember, Sue was just like serving constantly, oh, yeah. pouring coffee and drinks and donuts and lots of good food. And yes, yes. Yeah. we were well fed and taken care of. You, but you came every week. And again, you weren't leading those studies saying, well, let's go get this done. I mean, you, you left week after week, like, okay, I have something to think about. So tell me about that time, mm-hmm. really just for my benefit. What did that feel like to you as you went through those studies? What was helpful? What wasn't? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, g- coming into that, I had already, I mean, at that point, I had been attending regularly for 12 years or so. So I've sat through a lot of sermons and a lot of Bible <laughs> classes. So I've heard all the basics. And and honestly, one of the things that bothered me, but I couldn't change how I felt about it, was that, that I wasn't just compelled, like any of the examples you mentioned up front in the intro, to just, 
oh yeah, there, there's a light bulb moment and take me to the baptistry, right? Like I, I never felt that way and it bothered me and it made me think, okay, well, even if I agree with these sort of things and I would hear a lot, like you don't have to understand everything. And it's like, I know you don't have to understand everything, but I'm also concerned that <laughs> I don't feel moved about yeah. this, even though I am still concerned about it and I am introspective about it. And I don't know why that is. Right. And so I, I was constantly going through this process of trying to figure out why am I not moved to act? And it must be, there's still something, there's still some reservation. There's still some element of buy-in that I can't agree to or, or that I can't work through yet. And so what that study and some others that I did with, with some other individuals at, at previous points too, they're all a part of, for me, what's a complex multi-year process of, of sort of deconstructing all of these different challenges I had, mm -hmm. you know, and, and some of its misconceptions, some of it was just difficulty reconciling God's word with what I see in the world or how would I handle this in my own life or, or how should I treat others about this and, and having to work through those things and literally just sort of like, okay, well, here's, here's the next one that is now giving me a hard time. Right. And I would feel bad that I couldn't just leave one of those studies and be like, that one got me. I'm convinced. Let's go. Because I know that's what everybody there wanted. <laughs> yeah. You said the magic words. But but it was like, okay, so I'm going to use each one of these instances. And I would have to think hard. Like, okay, well, there's something still eating at me. What is it? Mm -hmm. And so I would just start bringing those. All right, well, here's what's been on my mind this week, right? I can't work through this and reconcile this with what I hear. You know, whatever that example may be. And, and there's, there's numerous ones. And, and some of it was things like, you know, I need to, I need to some find ways to verify things about the Bible outside of the Bible, right? And different specific examples of that. Some of it was things that you hear that are common objections around behaviors of, of you see in Christians oftentimes and things like that. And that, that was sometimes was one, but, and again, it was a place where I started really looking at it and going, well, is my issue with what they're supposed to be doing? Or is my issue with the fact that they're human and they're fallible and, <laughs> and therefore, my problem isn't with God's word, it's with people's adherence to it, mm -hmm. right? And then that's what I'm struggling with. So there's some of that. And then there were there were other examples too. You know, one of them one of them being you hear a lot, like there's a lot of awful stuff in the world. How can how can God be loving and care about us with all of the things that happen in the world? Mm -hmm. And and I would hear answers to that that I didn't necessarily think, oh, that doesn't make sense or it's wrong, or I disagree. But it, it's like it it felt of like yeah that's an answer academically but it right. it doesn't actually explain it to me if that makes sense it does make sense there's huge challenges in scripture that we have to be honest about that's one of them yeah god's in control he can change anything it, it with you know by his word he can change anything that he wants to and he's allowing it so tell me why and then like you said the academic explanation is well here's here's the best we can understand by the what he's given to us and someone tries to present that and you go okay but he can still do it so i'm still asking the same question why doesn't he fix this this and this whatever that might be and uh, and so that's a very difficult thing to come to terms with and just and just be settled in that so honestly until the answer a good one is given from the word of god and even as you said externally that there's evidence of these things to be true independent from god's word but also objectively fact, you know, just true, that that would be confirming for you. There's the um, God's love. And, mm -hmm. I, you know, for me, this was a big one. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his only beloved son. And so now we're his children. Right. Yeah. He, cruci he allowed his son that he loved who was with him in glory to be crucified. So now we're his kids. I'm not sure I understand the exchange there. He, right. He loved his son. Now he's got us potentially but he'll crucify those whom he loves the most. So, you know, that, that could be a huge stumbling block for people. That does not make sense. And yeah. so it, it really, and, and so for someone to go, well, here's my explanation that may or may not cut it for you because that's a deep thought question. And I think one of the things that was really helpful in that particular study was the indiv individuals involved would be like, well, let's take a look. No, nobody was like, Oh great. That one's on my, objection bingo card <laughs> <laughs> and would jump straight to a verse. I, I do feel like genuinely they're like, okay, you know, let's, let's take a look at it. And, and what I would get presented because a lot of the things that I was bringing up weren't just, well, where does it say to do this? You know, or where right. does it say not to do that? 
it's an application and the individuals who, who were so helpful and thoughtful would say, well, let's, let's just look at different things together and work through that. Right. And, and see what we can come up with. And, and, and most of them had an idea like they, I've got, I've got an explanation for you, but I'll admit to you, it may not be letter for letter, what you can read. You have to just understand certain aspects of God. And then you start to see these things and and they're reinforced with examples that you can point to in the Bible. Mm. But we have to also take, we have to extrapolate some understanding there of, of how, how God would, would explain these situations or what examples he's given to us and how to apply those. And so, you know, I, for, for example, I remember in particular Ed Snap saying a number of times whenever there were certain things I would bring up, he'd say, well, my belief is we take these scriptures that say this, and I think the application of that in the situation you brought up is this. Mm. He said, I'm, I'm not trying to say that's absolute, but based on what I see, I believe that's a really strong, sound explanation. And I appreciated that honesty, which is yeah. which is not that like, Oh, it is so clear cut here. I mean, there are some things that are absolutely, but, but there are the, the places I was going were, were harder because those were the things that I was really like, I couldn't work out on my own or at least at that point. And so I appreciated the fact that it's like, well, I'm going to tell you what I think that is informed and I can point to what is informing that, but it does reply us using or require us to use our brains beyond just, you know, being shown the example of the math problem and then copying the example of the math problem. God's expecting us to to do some work on this on our part, and here's what I think the answer is. Yeah. And you may not get an absolute answer, though. Right. But you have to understand that this is a reasonable explanation given what we know. And, and that actually helped me a lot. Because mm. then as I started you know, encountering other things and, and trying to work through them on myself, I'd be like, okay, I, I know this isn't, whatever this issue may be, isn't going to be spelled out explicitly. I need to look for what is what is the nature of God, and a lot of these things that I kept bringing up just helped build out, helped to build out a bigger, better picture of what the nature of God is, and then little by little that helped me understand. Okay, now this next thing that I'm struggling with, I understand God more based on these other things that we've looked at, and I can, I can start to see how this would work, or or what God means by this, or why God behaves this way or chooses this or allows this. But it, it was a process for me, right? It, yes, it, was, it was it was like chipping away at different things. It wasn't linear. Um, right. It sounds to me that based on what you just said, there's passages that talk about the the new newly baptized Christian, their babes in Christ, and that they desire the sincere milk of the word, that they may grow thereby. And in, in that process, and it's written in Hebrews as well, that it's, at some point we get to the meat. And it sounds to me, based on what you just said, that you had some understandings of God's character and, and who he is, his personality, if you will. And then once that was kind of understood and solidified in your mind, then when you get to the next challenging thing, you don't abandon what you've already worked through. So I, I'm just seeing milk that this is true. This has been settled in my mind. Now I can move to step two in, you know, in your own mind and never abandon what I've already believed to be true in the first part. So, I mean, it really does fit the scriptural explanation of give the milk and, and lay down the foundation that it's a simple truth to understand that God provides. And then when he says, now this one's tougher, but you know that A, B, and C are true about me. So don't let go of that and now work this out in that framework. Sounds to me that's exactly what you were doing. Exactly. I think that's nice. a really good good way to think about it. And and again, one of the verses that actually did sort of click for me, and I, and I believe, if I recall correctly, Brother Ed Snap was the one who pointed it out, was, uh, was Philippians 2.12. And so the whole idea of working out your faith, that was one of the things that I said, yes, that's exactly what I'm having to to do mm -hmm. here. And I think in most of the other examples we have, right, it's, it's exposure, explanation, yes, let me go, right? And and I wanted to be that, but I wasn't. Like it was, it was like, no, I don't know. I've got all these other things that are – and, and, you know, in hindsight, looking at some of it, some of it's noise, but some of it was like, no, if I, if I really believe this, then that means here are the behaviors in my life and the things that, that I need to address. But some of those I have a hard time reconciling, with, reconciling with what I see in the world. Mm -hmm. And how am I going to work through that? I've got to figure out, like, to do this, I need to be able to work through that. Otherwise, I'm, I'm being hypocritical. So, yeah, that, that's where a lot of those things came into play. Um, 
for me. And, and uh, you're right. It provided a framework to like, all right, let's look at different examples. And now you get a complexion of how to apply this to the next answer. Yeah. It's building blocks. There's something else that's really keeps coming to my mind as, as we're going through this because of your careful attention. And like you said, some of it may have been noise, especially in hindsight, you think that was, uh, I spent too much time there, whatever those may be. But we're looking at opposed to the one who says, you don't really need to understand all that. Just believe in G- that Jesus is the son of God, which is true. The scripture found true. it yep. true. You don't, you, don't have, you don't have to know everything. You have to have every answer in the Bible. But for you to say, no, this is big. And if I'm going to commit to it, it needs to be because I am committed to it. And, and then so, you know, maybe I can't prove this, but you're taking that final step uh, in faith. There could not have been a doubt in your mind. I mean, I think even the toughest critic could, you could, couldn't have stumped you uh, in that moment because you had honestly gone through all of that. So, you know, I don't know really what to make of that, but, but the person who says, man, my heart's touched and I've been, I've been a sinner too long and I want to be saved and they come forward. Well, they would be just as saved as you were according to what the new Testament reveals. But you just seem to be more grounded in what you've understood and committed yourself to. I don't see you getting pushed out of where you are now because of that process, right? I, doesn't that make sense? Yeah, I, and I think that's a big part of what I needed before I could make that commitment, which was confidence in myself that I believed this strongly enough that I can handle the objections I'm going to encounter in the world and the pushback that I'm, I'm going to see constantly that prior to making this step, I could just kind of ignore like, okay, it's there, but whatever, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't apply to me. <laughs> right. Right. Um, I needed that or I'm like, or what's the point? Like, it's not, I'm not really committing to it. I'm only committing to it in name only or, you know, it, and maybe that's not entirely fair. Like maybe, maybe, maybe in heart, I would still want to believe it, but I wouldn't really be acting on it, living it in a way if I don't, understand that I'm going to encounter objections. I'm going to encounter maybe even doubts around specific things here and there in my own faith Mm -hmm. from time to time. There's going to be times where I'm going to be like, something gets introduced, something happens in my life. Somebody poses some question that I haven't come across before. And is that, is that going to be enough to, you know, take me off track? And I needed to feel confident enough that no, I can handle that. It doesn't mean I might not have moments where You know, I'm having to go re-break down the process again and figure out something, but I had done enough of those where it's like, well, so far I've been able to get, you know, some of them are harder than others, but I've been able to, to get to the other side of all of them. Yeah. I don't know what the tipping point was because like I said, there wasn't a moment where I'm like, okay, you know, I had 37 objections and we got to 37. (laughs) So let's go. It was, it was more of like whittling away and then sort of the next ones I could figure out on my own and the next one I could figure out on my own and the next one, you know, and, and I mean, there was a compelling moment for me to finally act, Mm -hmm. but the notion of all of those sort of pieces of building my faith by basically getting, addressing the different things that challenged it, the different doubts and sort of knocking those off the list was definitely the process I had to go to, to give me the, the confidence that, I could continue doing that as those things continue to come up. Yeah. And you're now you're well qualified. Again, just the benefit of that is you're well qualified to have a conversation with anyone else who's in the same boat you are. I, I really think you're I hope you're, so. <laughs> I do too. I think you're a better candidate <laughs> than say um someone like myself. I, I study, present, preach sermons all the time. I have answers for things, but I never sat in the seat that you sat in for a good long time. And to say to someone, your concerns, your questions about the Word of God, is God real, you know, from, from that first beginning question all the way down to, should I really do this in order to be saved? Those are legitimate and fair questions that need to be answered. And, and no one can say that, I, at least in my mind, no one can say that more honestly and uh, to say, I know what you're going through, if that's the better way to put it, than you. I suspect there are others who've gone through the same process. Maybe it didn't take as long. <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, kudos to them. Uh, <laughs> and there's probably those who never did or or maybe have contemplated it seriously, but never taken the action because they're stuck in that same scenario. And, and I'll be honest, if I didn't have so many people that I cared about, including my wife and, and my family and those influences, like, I don't know. I mean, I probably would have drug it out even longer. It, mm. it, it probably would have been something that I still like back to that original comment around gentle pressure is is certainly helpful because 
you know, the, the compelling act in the back of my mind around all of this is, you know, my wife was very convicted of it. And so I should pay attention. And then she's concerned about me because of it. So that was the motivating reason to at least start paying attention and listening. And then that's also the reason to, to try and add urgency. But also at the same time, I'm countering that again, where I'm not there yet. And, and I know that's not the answer anybody wants to hear, but I'm having to, to work through that. And, and I can't imagine I'm alone in that boat. I just suspect we don't talk about it in that way as often. It's harder to fit that into a sermon, probably. It's a little <laughs> yeah. bit longer. Yes. Can't point to just the, the easier examples. But that, that's why for me, I feel like it's, it's really important. There are some people who just respond and their heart is all in. And I think that, that's awesome. That's amazing. Mm. And that's great. And we should continue to look for that. And, and then I think there are those who want to be there, but they're, like I said, wrestling with something similar like I was. And you've got to really figure out where they are, which, you know, what stage are they struggling? Like, do they, do they not even believe in a creator? All right, well, let's, let's start there. Exactly. Or, or they're down that path, but they're not sure it's the Bible. They're not sure about Jesus, you know, and let's start there. They're, or they're, they're kind of in and out of it. But like I said, you know, they're, they're struggling with, the way this world is doesn't seem like what God would have made if God loved us. Right. And, and and again, there's lots of other things in between along that spectrum, but you've got to know where that is. Yes. And then go there. And for me, again, it was jumping around through some of those, but yeah, man, I think all of that is fantastic. So what, what we will do is we're going to, we'll, we'll give offer a series to the extent that we need to, to cover some of these bigger topics for you. There are people who are hitting that brick wall that you once stood in front of and looked at and thought, okay, I, I need to figure out what this means for me. Uh, we want to see those. And you have individual cases, especially those big points. Um, you had given an invitation on Wednesday night. Is God just or uh, fair? What, what was the title of it? Uh I don't know if I formally gave it a title oh, okay. because, it, because it was the invitation, but but the whole idea was was basically I loathe the idea of fairness. <laughs> oh, nice. So we we use that as the the uh, what do we call it? The carrot stick for yeah, for exactly. people because I want I do I'm going to need you to come back to us and and talk about that very topic, uh, fairness, and and that that was again one of the challenges that you saw in your own personal study moving towards conversion, and it was a question that needed to be answered because as you presented that on that Wednesday night, I mean, I, for me, like this light bulb come, came on and I thought you're one of the most interesting stories in my life about hearing the truth really for the period of time that you did. And then your conversion, all of it is very interesting to me. And so to be able to listen to these individually and quantify them. So as long as you're willing to, we'll, we'll look at each one of those. As we move through, absolutely, I, I would love to do that with you. And like I said, the the thoughts that you had, even that Wednesday night, in the brief amount of time you had, were fantastic. And it's good again because Christian and non Christian can hear what you're working through and the presentation of that. And and we're all going to see something there. I'm just sure of it. We're going to see. Yeah, I've been there. I thought about that, and I bet that you brought up some things in this particular study that. Others have not thought about it. Like, well, that's a pretty big deal. I need to know what the answer to that is. So I think it's super valuable. It also shows that as we study the Word of God, we are not, we're not going to slip anything by people. We shouldn't. You deserve an answer, right? And it, uh, the Lord says in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18, come, let us reason together. He, he calls his people and says, come sit with me and let's work this out. That God says that to us. So for, for those of us who want to share the truth that God has given to us, it's a huge mistake to be like, I hope they don't bring this up. That's not fair to that person. <laughs> right. Yeah. We need to say, here's the best we can do, which is what seems to happen in, in your situation over and over again, which you said was helpful to you. And that is fantastic. Today, now that we've kind of started this, we'll do our trivia questions. All right. And you have those. I do. I do. <laughs> I know that you do. Um, so, so let me go first. Oh boy! To give you time to just sweat it out right away. <laughs> Are you ready? As ready as I'm going to be. <laughs> I have to ask that. I don't know why. Trivia, sweet trivia. First question for Ben. First question for all of you. In Luke chapter two, 
we're told that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Where did Joseph have to go in order to be registered? He had to leave Nazareth, which is where he's from, and he went to what town? I can give you one clue if you need it. I'll take one clue. Do I have to phone a friend? Or a... Yeah, I'm your friend right now, <laughs> like it or not. His betrothed wife, Mary, was very pregnant, and they had to go to a particular town. I'm going to feel really silly. Um, there's a lot of dead space you're going to have to... Edit out here, Danny. <laughs> no, it's good for our listeners because they're like, <laughs> what is the name of that town? So there's a there's a, a Christmas hymn about it. Oh, little town of... Bethlehem. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Danny. See so, the music. As soon as I mention the music. Yes, yes. Uh, like I told you, I got even the simple stuff I freeze on. In the <laughs> <laughs> Ellen said the same thing. She's like, I knew the answer to everything you asked me, but... But in the moment, in I'm the like... In the moment, uh, with the pressure... Uh, it's something about it, man. It's All real. that was going over my head is Nazareth, but it's not Nazareth. Like I was like, that's like, why can't I think of any other town right now? <laughs> <laughs> Your brain's like, just say Nazareth. <laughs> so Luke, Luke chapter two and verse four says that Joseph left Nazareth and went to Bethlehem because he was of the house of the lineage of David. That's why he had to go back to Bethlehem, which the prophecy said the Christ would be born yep. in Bethlehem. It's awesome. Okay. Your first question for me and the second one for everyone else. All right. So I went a little more broadly, so I'm probably not the best trivia question writer, but I'm going to ask you, is Paul ever sarcastic in his writings? Oh, man. Do you need an example? Because my answer is yes. Good. All right. Okay. Yes. Uh, and, you, and so I'm, you're probably thinking of some specific ones. Let, let me tell you the first one that I'm thinking of. Okay. And I'm trying to grab more as I say that slowly. He says to the Corinthian church, I thank God that I baptized none of you. I, I feel like that is <laughs> that, <laughs> sarcasm. He could be because he's telling them you're so divided over who did what for you that he's like, I'm glad I wasn't more involved. Of course, he needs to baptize those who who come to to the faith. He himself was baptized, so, so that's the one I'm thinking of. That's a great one, and I was thinking there's a number of examples, especially the Corinthians. But I was mm. thinking like really pretty much the whole Second uh, uh, Corinthians chapter eleven verses one through fifteen is kind of a a whole rant that's sarcastic, oh. right? And he jumps in and he says, hey, I'm trying to remember exactly how he, how he phrases it, but it's like, all right, let, let me be foolish for a moment, right? And, mm. and a lot of different examples there. The reason I call that out, that I think it's really interesting, one of those things that, again, helps me understand objections, what God wants us to understand there is people will take pieces of that out of context and, and apply it inaccurately. And then you go look at that and say, no, he's... He's talking to them because he's he's going to an extreme to prove a point. Exactly. And he's and just as we would. Mm -hmm. I mean, whenever I'm trying to knock my kids over the head or or whatever, my friend or something, I, do you do it too, Danny? Always do you, go to the extreme. Yeah. Yes. Maybe like go be a little bit over the top of the sarcasm so that way they get the point. <laughs> like, okay, yes, I, I realize. Yeah. I think it's interesting because you don't have a ton of examples of, of that. And I think it's what's sort of fascinating about Paul in particular is if you just read him straight through and you're not really – internalizing some of that, like it's easy to fly over and be like, wait a minute, this sounds the opposite of what he should be saying. Yeah. And you're like, oh no, oh, oh, I see. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was He's needling. letting them have it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's good. And it also <laughs> lends, that question lends itself to what we're talking about. So <laughs> well done, sir. Question number three for everyone out there. And the second one and last one, it's almost over. The last one for Ben in Acts chapter 16, when Paul and Silas were in prison, there was a great earthquake, and all the prison doors were opened, and everyone's chains fell off of them. What is the first thing that the Philippian jailer mm. tried to do when he thought that the prisoners had all run away? Kill himself. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Acts 16 and verse 27, supposing the prisoners had fled, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. So you got that right. Word for word, Kurt awards the perfect answers with gold stars. So, Oh, excellent. You've gotten your first gold got my star. my first gold star. Yes, that's kind of a big deal here. I'll take that. <laughs> that's really cool. And you know, that <laughs> what's interesting about him is the same night he's baptized. Yeah, exactly. Nothing like you at all. No, although had I experienced an earthquake and all the chains fell, <laughs> maybe it would have been different. I don't, yeah. you know, there were, there's certainly some more extreme examples. And so I can't, can't rule that out. But, well said. But You're absent right. of that. 
most of us are just kind of going through a normal day to day life, and we don't we don't see those things until we start really looking for them, and they're not going to be that grand. But if you just start paying attention, there are those signs there for us. Yeah, um, amen. I, I'm giving you probably a layup here, but anyway, I, I will, I'll do it anyway. Who is it that Jesus says to act more like children? Well, specifically, my answer is to the apostles. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Why it was top of mind for me and kind of why I went there is I think the elements of that, of, of being humbled, being curious, always asking the question and not just assuming the answer, whether even whenever it's something that's laid out for us in the word or whether it's not just a sort of assuming the answer of the world or assuming the answer that we just see at, at face value. And that's not necessarily what God's expecting of us. He's expecting us to be curious. Yeah. He's expecting us to dig a little bit deeper and to have, and to be open just, just like in, in that way, humbling ourselves from a knowledge standpoint, which, which I think was another part of what I was working through during all that process was like, you kind of have to come back and, and you recognize how little you do know and understand at different points. And you have to like say, all right, I, I need to take a step back and, and pay, ask some deeper questions and pay some more attention here. I don't know as much as I think I do. Yeah, exactly. And that's okay. And that's it okay. Really that's what's expected of us. And that's, I mean, what you just said, that's the very reason that I've, that I've asked you to be here and, uh, and be a part of this as, as we work through it together. I'm so thankful that you're willing to do that. Um, I've seen all that you have become, and I'm just going to use this to kind of close us out, but I've seen all that you've become through that process of time with all those initial questions that everyone in, in the congregation had. But your growth and development from that point has been a tremendous uh, and amazing in, in my eyes, uh, looking at a man who is, again, faithful to his wife and committed to attending services, hearing those sermons preached every Sunday, not yet ready to commit fully to that. Certainly watch that. And now today, I'm telling you, it still it still gets me when just it's the simplest thing where someone says, uh, we'll, we'll be led in our closing prayer now, uh, Brother Ben Schneider, and I think Ben's going to pray for us. You know, that that's amazing because there was, a, as you said, you heard so many sermons. There's a lot of closing prayers you heard too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't you being called on. And, and you didn't, none of that was a motivator for you. you. You simply wanted to know the answer, came to the right conclusion after doing the thorough study that you had done. And now, you know, you're a deacon at the local church and, and, and you offer thoughts for the Lord's Supper. And, and, and so, you know, again, just for me, I know that there's a, there's a deep sense there that I've been able to see and understand. I know that all of us have it. I'm not taking anything away from any of our members or anyone else who loves the Lord, but there's just something special about uh, the way that you work through that and, and that final step that you had made. I have one question I wanted to just drop on you right. without prepping you for it. There are many people, and I say many, there's a few at Northwest who believe they know why you came forward. On the day that you came forward, you know where I'm going? Oh, probably. Yeah, yeah I do. <laughs> so your son, yes, the invitation was offered. Your son comes forward, and I think he may have made that known earlier to kind of prep us for he that. Did. He said, yeah. "I'm coming forward," and you came up right behind him. You said there was like that missing moment where it's like, "I'm doing this." Did he have an effect on that? Did you already decide? He absolutely did. Okay. In the moment, I had already been, and, it, and it's a valid question. I, I had already been. Well, partially because I'd already been going through those those studies, I was getting very close at that point. And mm -hmm. like I said, I was starting to to get to a point to where like I I do feel like I can defend this. And 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 coincidentally, he was at a stage where he wanted to come forward and he had, had made that known and had been talking about it. And certainly what was on my mind was like, I do feel this is this is a sign to me that I have reached a point where I can apply it and, and I can live it in a way that makes sense. And I need to do that for him. Yeah. And so I was, I was very much there myself and knowing that he was likely going to do that as well. I'm like, well, I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to, I've got to do this. He's not going there by himself. No, I no, want to do it. I mean, in, in full candor, would I have done it that night? Had he not, I, I might not, but I was, I was very close. I was within days of that sure. you know, already. Yeah. And so, Again, probably it was certainly, but, but I felt it knowing that he was likely going to do that. I had already been thinking to myself, I'm like, what is, what at this point, what is still 
do I still have things that I don't think I can work through? Yeah. I had, I had had enough of those studies and been through enough of this where I was like, there's going to be more stuff that comes up. There's no, it's never going to stop. Right. There aren't going to, I had reached that realization that there will be more things that I have doubts about, or I have, I have concerns or I can't, I'm not sure how to reconcile, but yet every single one of those that I've had with some study discussion with others who are knowledgeable and really looking at it and just, I've been able to get through it. So sufficiently answered, sufficiently answered that will keep happening. So that gave me that confidence and that, that belief. And so, yeah, there, there was, it's, it's not an unrelated element for sure in terms of the specific moment. Okay. Well, I, you didn't even have to answer that because that's very personal. But like I said, there's, you know, there's been some speculation about, well, once his son went up, there's nothing he could do. <laughs> but, but you know, that's okay. It's okay. I, I think the the way to think about it was when he was, when he was going to do that, I, my mind, my mind had already been made up, but I was still sort of like, there is an element. And, and I know this is true for, for some people who worship with us right now. They actually, even when they want to follow and they want to go forward, they they actually are concerned about the attention to themselves right. in doing it. And, and you've said that many times, like you mm-hmm. have to be baptized at the end of a Wednesday service or Sunday, like you can do that anytime and it can be a smaller, you know, as many people as is appropriate, right? Like that's not a condition, but it does weigh because that's normally where, where people feel compelled right in that moment. Mm-hmm. And I will say that was a part of it for me. For sure. Like I didn't after, so it's your point, like people, many people thought, didn't know I wasn't a member if they weren't, (laughs) you know, if they'd only been worshiping there recently or whatever. Yeah. Right. Or hadn't checked the directory or or whatever. And so there was an element of like, I didn't want to, I I didn't want it to be awkward and draw a lot of attention to myself. And that shouldn't weigh on our hearts, but it does. It's a piece. I mean, we we have to acknowledge that we are human in that way. And it's hard to work through sometimes. So there was a piece of it for me that was like, I was getting there and I, and I was getting ready, but I didn't want to draw that attention to myself. Yeah. And so I'll say, I think probably really what the part of it there was, is like, well, the attention is already there at this point, mm-hmm. right? Like why at this point it's, it's on the issue. Just do it. Yeah. That's fair. And I, I also, yeah, I was like, I want to be with him on this, you know, whenever he goes on this journey and makes this commitment, right. I want to have been there with him for it. Yeah. I think it makes it more amazing. It's just, you know, it, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Uh, there was a commitment there from both of you on one day, and, and the Lord added two souls to his church, and that's that's exactly what happened. So uh, it, it is a, it's a great story for, for all the reasons I've mentioned, and, and it's a blessing to see and, and to, to watch you continue to grow. I'm going to finish uh, this episode with, with a passage. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 is one that I feel I can just easily tie to, to you and... and watching all of this. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe.